All right, we'll be getting started in just a few seconds. Hello, everybody. I'm going to give it a few minutes to let everyone uh, trickle on in. So get cozy, get yourself a nice uh, beverage and a snack, and uh, get ready to get the holiday spirit going. Hi everybody, I'm Catherine. Uh, thanks for joining me today. We're going to be making a tiny, well it actually might not end up being that tiny, we're going to be making a hand-sewn Christmas stocking out of hexagons. So we're going to be doing some English paper piecing and just really kicking off the uh, Yuletide Christmas spirit here. Uh, my name is Catherine Stocking Lopez, so if you were not prepared for stockings, uh, consider this your warning. <laughs> they, are, they are one of my favorite, favorite things and uh, we're going to make a really fun, uh, really rainbow-tastic little stocking here today. So I'm really excited. So come on in, trickle in, get yourself nice and cozy, and we'll be sewing today. Also shout out in the chat box if you guys have any questions. Um, I am very happy to teach. Um, if you want me to go faster, slower, uh, talk about what I'm doing at any point, just jump on chat and say, hey, can you elaborate on that? And I will be more than happy to. It is good to see you all today. All right, I'm going to jump into it because uh, no time like the present and I'm ready to have some crafting fun. So, what I have here today, uh, I'm really excited. This is actually a collaborative project. Um, if you've never heard of English paper piecing, I'm going to be talking about it quite a bit. So I'll use the uh, abbreviation EPP. That stands for English paper piecing. And uh, that is patchwork that is enabled with the help of little paper pieces, in this case, little hexagons. And that allows us to make very specific shapes and then sew them together and keep said shape. Um, so it's a really fun way to do these nice crisp uh, edges and get all these 
fun geometric shapes without having to have a bunch of weird scenes and it's quite fun it's one of the things i very much enjoy so i'm really excited to be doing some epp with you guys today um, i'm going to be using this existing beautiful uh, needlepoint stocking here as my template so um, i had it flipped over because it was distracting but i actually want my stocking going this way so we're gonna start by just kind of laying everything out and seeing where it goes um, so my mom, who um, you sometimes see her on Twitch here in my comment section as Quilting Koala, uh, that's that's my mom, uh, she likes to do a lot of quilting, um, a lot of sewing. She's actually who taught me how to sew, um, and her mom taught her how to sew, and now I get to teach my daughter. So I'm really, really, really tickled and really proud um, anytime I do something with her or with my daughter, because um, it just feels like we're carrying on our like family tradition and our family legacy. So. She actually made all of these hexagons, these little paper hexagons, for a 100 Days of Hexes challenge. So I have quite a few of them, and um, I've been tasked with putting them together, and that is really fun for me because I don't actually fancy making, I don't know, sometimes it's fun to make these. I like the glue method, it feels very arts and craftsy, and I get to just make a bunch of hexagons, but other times I feel like sewing, and it's nice to just have things ready to go. So I'm actually really, really hyped for this. Uh, because I get to uh, just do the fun part in my opinion and just go for it. So for a little while here I'm just going to be arranging these uh, in a nice rainbow ombre and you guys can chime in and uh, join me. So we're gonna get these all flipped over like we're doing a big puzzle. So when she made these there was I'd say there was no rhyme and reason, but that's not actually true. Um, she was doing a little 100 hexes challenge, and there were different themes and stuff, uh, but she was actually more interested in using the entirety of this collection, which this is a fabric called Fossil Ferns. If I hold up one of those, you can see the, the fern pattern in there. Um, and they're just kind of a fun pseudo grunge fabric, kind of a medium density uh, with lots of botanicals and bubbles and especially when you cut them up into little like one inch pieces like this they just have a lot of variation and it's quite enjoyable um so we have a lot of the rainbow in here and uh we're gonna i i decided a, an ombre i think would look the best um i did play with the idea of just having them be random and you can see it here it's it's pretty like there's nothing wrong with just kind of the random um but the more i played with them and the more i looked at them the more i kind of decided that a rainbow ombre is where I wanted to go and that's because of what the project will end up being when I'm all finished with it um and well one it's gonna be a stocking but I have a, a surprise plan so if you'll bear with me um I do have a uh, a plan for the very end here that'll hopefully celebrate the ombre and make all of this worth it so I'm going to go I'm gonna go from purple all the way up and do pink at the top. So I'm just kind of looking at my fabrics here. The very pinky purples I'm going to save for the top, but the very blue purples I'm gonna save for the bottom. So right now we're just, uh, just sorting. And uh, this is the first Christmas music I've actually listened to this, this year, so I'm, just kind of vibing. Um, it's both fun and kind of actually mildly uh, eh, distressing is not the word. It's more just like, oh my goodness, it is that close to the holidays. I mean, we just, Thanksgiving just flew by, um, you know, and it's like, you know, I think every year as an adult, it's required to be like, wow, they, the years just fly, they, I, they just fly, but they really, they really are. Um, and it's not a bad thing necessarily. I love this time of year. It's more just I've got stuff to do, and I haven't finished it. So, but you know, I don't think that would really change. No matter how fast the year went, I think I will always uh, be a little bit behind on what I need to do, and that's just who I am as a person. But we're working on it. It's called character growth. I'm just gonna start playing with these and kind of get a rough layout. I'm using uh, this stocking underneath, this beautiful needlepoint one, as kind of a guide. I really like the shape. I could have traced it, 
Um, but, you know, why waste the paper? So, it's just hanging out here with me. Um, as we work on this. So, I'm, I know that because I'm just working with random pieces here that I might not have the, like, most perfect gradient ever. Um, but really, I'm just going for big picture, big picture gradient. Um, you know, just a nice transition where I can get it. So there's a lot of greens, um, and it's funny because green is definitely a Christmas color traditionally by most conventions, um, but I'm not 100% sure I love the green, so, and the yellow, even though yellow is my favorite color, um, I don't know, maybe it's just not doing it for me today. I, I, there is going to be something on top of this, but not to completely spoil the, uh, the end goal or the end game here. But there will be something on top of this, so I'm, I'm looking at this layout with that in mind. I obviously don't want to cover my very favorite parts, um, but if this stocking ends up being about to here, probably, um, then this is kind of where I'm going to be putting something on top of that. So that will help uh, in the planning stages, because yeah, you definitely don't want to cover over uh, like your favorite part there. Which my brain would definitely try and do. It'd be like, oh, I'm going to be putting something in the center, center, center. And then I would uh, get hyper fixated on the center and then end up covering all my gorgeous work. But, you know, we live and we learn, so. So this is uh, the type of project, too, where you need to lay everything out. And then it's immediately going to get taken apart. Uh, just the way that these things get sewn together. Uh, it won't be able to stay in this nice layout. So this is not pointless. Um, it's more of a, we're laying this out for exploration purposes only, and then we live with the process as it goes. Uh, it's definitely, you know, certain projects have a little bit more of a uh, rhyme or reason, and then this one's a little bit more in the chaotic realm. But just the way that these things have to go together, this is more our guideline. Um, and then we do our best to stick to it, and then we're going to have to cut some of these in half to keep the shape. Um, but really, we're just going for a big picture here. I'm making up the shape, I'm making up the rules. It's not like, like in the best ways, it's none of this is, you know, I'm not following a pattern, none of it matters, so I get to make the rules. Um, so hopefully it'll turn out semi-decent, um, and if it doesn't, I have nobody to blame but myself. So what I'm going to start by doing is... Uh, I have all my pieces um, laid out like this, and I'm going to appreciate this gorgeous rainbow for a hot second because I love this, and it turned out super duper cute, and I love rainbow, I need to have a beer, um, but I also just think it's a really fun way to bring in some pride of the holidays, and I think this is super cute. So I'm going to take a picture of this because goodness knows that I will forget immediately uh, what I have laid out. Hello sunshine, there we go. If I don't take a picture of it. And like I said, uh, it's really not that important to um, stay to a hard and fast layout. So this is again, more just guidelines. Very, very, very piratey rules here. They're just suggestions. It's not a hard and fast uh, code. And the reason for um, all that prefacing on this is because when we start sewing these together, and I very well may just start from the middle. Um, I'm going to have to pick them up, pair them off, put them down, make little sections. Like, yes, I'm sure there's probably a smarter way to do this. But, you know, I have only mild experience with all of this. And so I'm making up my own rules. And, you know, that's just how it's going to be. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to be using a ladder stitch throughout pretty much this entire project, um, which I will probably go back and forth and explain several times, uh, just as y'all pop in and out on the feed. Um, but a ladder stitch, you take a small stitch, you take a small stitch in on one, and then you hop your thread over and then go up and over and up and over. And it makes like very geometric zigzag. Um, and then when you pull it tight, it cinches uh, very, very nicely um, for things like this, for things like plushie making when you're sewing up that final seam. 
Um, it's a really grand stitch, so I like to use it for my EPP. Um, you could also use a whip stitch. Uh, there's really no right or wrong uh, answer, especially when you are doing this. All right, good to see you guys in chat as well too. Again, um, I love chatting with you guys. If you have questions, um, want me to explain something again, or you want to get me distracted on a totally random tangent, ask me about my crafting, ask me about anything. Um, I'm happy to chat. done um, almost oops, finished with this little edge here on the lip stitch and then I will show you guys the magic of the ladder stitch. I'm also sewing with a double thread so occasionally occasionally um, I will make a giant hot mess of the threads just because nature of the beast um, so you'll see lots of knots and then hopefully I can get them untied and we continue on but I like to sew with two threads it just feels more secure to me um, but it does end up with quite a lot of knots quite often, so it's one of those trade-offs where, you know, it's not very fast, but that's all right. Okay, so you can see that I've got these two sewn together, and right now with the, the tension that I have, they're quite loose, but when I pull that very nicely, oh, it's beautiful, every single time, uh, it makes a really lovely seam that's very crisp, uh, there's no threads showing at all, um, and it just makes the EPP really lovely. So I like to uh, tie a knot in between each one so that the tension doesn't slip if you were, you know, I'm sure you don't need it. It's just one of those things that I've kind of developed as a habit because that way I know my, um, if I set this down, my tension won't completely run out, or if I decide to cut my thread, then I know that there's a knot there. And so it's just part of me trying to develop slightly better habits as I go along. Okay, so then we just grab the next one and we just keep on sewing. Um, because they are hexagons, they do have six sides, so each one will eventually be needed. Will need to be joined on uh, six sides, so sometimes the sewing pattern isn't the most efficient because you're not just doing like rows. Um, you'll kind of zigzag it the best you can back and forth. Um, and then there'll be like one weird seam you need to go back and get. But you know, we're sewing with a weird shape and you know, we're making it into a sock shape. <laughs> and so, it, you know, efficiency is not the name of the game here. We're, uh, we're more worried about just uh, getting it in the nice pattern that we've like set out in the rainbow ombre that we have devised and then just uh, taking our time with it. Untying all the knots that we like to tie by ourselves. The real treasure were the uh, knots we tied in the thread along the way. There we go. Okay, I shouldn't feel so proud for being able to untie a knot that I tied myself, but you know, I am taking every small victory I can get. That was the real treasure. The real treasure is the small victories we win along the way. I was reading a story with uh, pirates the other day, so my apologies in advance for the inevitable pirate puns and stuff I'm going to make today. I just feel it leeching out of me. It's the good old hyperfixation brain. Every single one of these is going to be kind of the same deal, and uh, honestly, that's quite meditative uh, to me to just, wow, this thread's really, really knotted today. Uh, just to be able to know that that's not going to change. Um, like, this is complicated enough as it is with like making the little hexagons and then keeping it all wrangled. It's nice to know that in the middle here, there's just a step that doesn't change too much. I think a lot of crafts have that kind of meditative uh, thing going on. I'm I'm not the best at like knitting, knitting and crocheting. I've actually never tried crocheting, um, but I do knit. 
Um, and sometimes that can be too repetitive for my brain and then I'll overthink it um, and then get lost. Um, so I like things that are like medium repetitive like this where there's a medium repetitive bit in the middle uh, but then it like shifts up technique wildly um, from the beginning all the prep work and then at the end like the construction of this will actually be on the machine and so it's nice for my brain at least to kind of be able to jump um, between mediums and steps and all that sometimes I wonder uh, you know if what how different my brain would be if I could focus differently or whatever but that's like this you know all of our brains are different for a reason and you know, this is just how my brain works and you know I think that's what's fun too is obviously if we could all do the same crafts the all the same way there wouldn't be um at least from like yeah I can definitely go and appreciate a friend's craft because they think in a different way or they do a different medium and there's an awe for me that's like wow you made that and it's like yeah you can make things too it's like yeah but I make different things and you do different things and it's you know, if it, we all just made the same same thing in the same exact way, it might not might not be as special. And so, uh, yeah, I am tying some crazy knots today. Now, see, that might not be how other professionals work, but I don't know what it is with this thread today either. Certain threads just love to make knots, um, and this one apparently is going to be like that. So, I'll just have to be careful. So, there's three, so you can see that it's really like. They're, they're joining, so I have it sewn here and here. So I'll have to go in and sew that one, but maybe when I have another line, I'll get like a good long uh, trail of stitches or something going. So it's really just, I'm sure if you analyze the whole path kind of like a battlefield, you could probably make a pretty decent um, and efficient path, but um, efficient is not always a word that's in my vernacular, so. We're gonna do it the uh, the way it happens. All right. I'm actually gonna snip that because I want to restart. I do not know what's going on right now. There we go. Sometimes that just happens. It gets a little twisted. It gets a little naughty, and then yeah. Like if you're sewing on a machine, if anything ever starts going wrong, just just unthread your machine and start again. Uh, that'll solve 90% of your problems. Okay. So like speaking of path efficiency, like if I was to sew this one to this one, then I could come back and, choo -choo -choo and get four like right in a row. So I'm gonna do that. parallel on one side, hop over perpendicularly, and then just a couple little millimeters and up right under the fabric, um, over and up. And the, the best way to describe it is um, you're kind of just getting that needle in very subcutaneously. There is a piece of paper in here, and you're definitely trying not to get into the paper, um, but you can kind of feel it, um, so it's like a nice ridge. And you use that to keep your needle parallel to the other places, um, but then also just right in the seam allowance that you've created by folding this over the little paper guide. And so that when you take the paper out, because you eventually will take the paper out, um, the paper does not stay. Uh, you can recycle them at the end. Um, but the paper comes out and um, then you're just left with like perfectly pieced hexagons because of the uh, way that you sewed them. So there's another one that like perfectly pulled. You can see the ladder stitch, kind of feel the tension there. And then I'm going to tie off my little knot. Like I said, that way then, no matter what, I know that those two are uh, secure. And so you can tie a knot, or you can do what's called traveling, which is where you just kind of stick your needle in the back, pull it out on the seam allowance side, take a small stitch, and then kind of aim it where you're trying to get to. For example, that bottom corner. And then when I put this back to where I want it, I can just jump over and, uh, and sew again. So 
this is my actually my favorite part is where it starts to get a little bit uh, complicated. It runs into like a really fun geometric puzzle um, where you've got to make this shape. So then you have to figure, okay, I'm sewing the, the boundary of the purple and the pink together. So I need to fold that this way, sew along that way, and then open it back up again. Um, I've definitely botched that. Uh, I was about to say, <laughs> um, now I can talk about what I'm doing. Doesn't necessarily mean it always comes out perfect or that I certainly don't have to uh, unpick things. It just definitely still happens. Um, but more of just that, like, I don't know, I like to challenge my brain and I like to do puzzles and just kind of having to think in a different way uh, proprioceptively is, is delightful. So. Keep on ladder stitching up. And occasionally I am going to let my thread just hang and kind of drop it down. This gets all those tangles out um, and stops it from being so twisty. If you notice your thread is doing that on itself, um, where it's making that little loop, that means your threads are twisted and you need to untwist them. And the easiest way to do that is just to drop your needle and uh, let, it, let it sort itself back out. Because anything you can do to stop it from kind of making a mess of itself is going to be helpful. For yourself in the long run so. so i'm just gonna get into this corner here and then pull and then when i open it back up you can see that that is joined so i want to make sure i adjust my tension while i'm in there and then i'm going to continue on so for ones in the middle here um you can totally still fold these so i have it Kind of bent like that. I'm gonna make sure I tie a knot because um, that I feel like that's where it's the most fragile. Um, are these little uh, joins at every one of the little hexagon corners? Oops. I said the paper. There we go. Pull that back out. up I'm doing the um, border between this purple and uh, this blue here. I might be switching thread here in a second because normally I don't have this many issues with thread but sometimes that happens. Yeah I'm gonna switch thread. So luckily I just tied a knot uh, which is why that's important. And I'm just gonna snip this free. Good. You can see that it's coming along, and then I put this back in place, which was kind of, you know, this-ish. You can see that it's, it's coming along. Alright. I'm going to give this thread one more chance. Um, Could have just been a, a bad piece. I thought this was good thread. And then if it's being weird with a double thread, I might switch to a single thread. Uh, there's a lot of ways to troubleshoot this kind of stuff as you're going along. Um, as long as really, as long as it's sewing and you're not getting too horrendously frustrated, then it's a, it's a win for me. So there we go. All right, so I'm going to continue there. I'm going to make sure if I have any threads sticking out that I use this opportunity to pull them to the back because the back can look messy, but we want the front to be cute. I'm going to get a little bit of a running start and go back um, because I was worried about that thread. So I'm just going back between the purple and the pink, and then I'll continue between the purple and the blue. Okay. Might be a little overstitched, but I'd rather have that than have any uh, holes in my work later on. So I'll get right back caught up here. Good to see you guys all uh, jump on in. I hope you guys are uh, having a wonderful holiday weekend, and if you celebrate, um, 
Thanksgiving, however you do. I hope that you had one um, that was full of good food and good blessings and uh, that you realize that we are lucky to have what we have. We can always make our situation better for ourselves and for the people around us and the people that have been hurt through history and the people that are suffering now. Um, so I hope that if you are fortunate enough to be able to do so, you are able to help out. Um, and if you are not, that you are able to find the help that you need. So I'm going to keep moving up uh, between the pink and the blue here. Doing that same ladder stitch. Again, that's going in on one side, going up, coming over, up and over. And so when you pull, it creates the perfect amount of tension uh, in between your seams. If you are just joining us, uh, we are doing some English paper piecing today. Uh, that means we are using uh, little bits of fabric wrapped around little pieces of paper. And I am currently sewing them together to make a Christmas stocking. And as always, if you have any questions about what it is I'm doing, how I'm doing it, what materials I'm using, uh, feel free to just jump on chat. I'm happy to go slow down and explain anything you guys would like. I'm here not only to make my own things, but to spread a little knowledge and a little bit of inspiration. So hopefully whatever you guys are looking for, you are finding it here, be it just the cozy atmosphere or the opportunity to learn something new. And so when I pull that tight, smoosh this back out. See, it that's uh, coming together. I still have a little piece of thread popping up, and I'm not sure why. So I'm going to take just a second and uh, see if I can figure that one out before we go too much farther. There we go. Sometimes uh, the old just kind of shove it back in there trick works. So now I'm going to come up between these two blues uh, and just keep on sewing. let me know if the audio is good, the music's good. I want you guys to be just as comfortable here as I am, so you guys let me know. So I do have a lot of basting thread um, in these, and a baste is uh, just what it sounds like. Uh, you know, sounds a lot like what you do to a turkey right before Thanksgiving. Um, but basting is just when you are prepping something for the uh, final rundown. And in the case of sewing, it's uh, stitches to hold everything in place while you then do the final stitches. Uh, but it does always kind of crack me up like the uh, culinary comparison. So, just doing the last. So I am here, I'll show you the ladder stitch with this one. You can see that the stitches are all perpendicular to my um, my pieces. And what I'm doing is taking that thread in and going parallel up, kind of uh, subcutaneously, right, right under the, the fabric skin, there is a uh, piece of paper in there. And I am not getting it caught in the paper. That's kind of the, uh, the trick and the magic here. Um, but then when I pull on these, can see that it comes together uh, like just absolutely perfectly so it's just a little trick where it's just a little bit about tension uh, a little bit about kind of stitch length and then you're good to go that's really that's that's the whole secret so there we go like i said i like to knot in between all of them just in case something happens um, but you can see when we put this back with our um, our other pieces here that it's coming together So when you get, um, let's see how many of that be, seven, seven of them together, 
it'll make a little flower. Uh, sometimes this pattern's called Grandma's Flower Garden, which is really sweet. Uh, but it's kind of just your basic uh, hexy patchwork block. Um, because these can then, if you made like a whole bunch of these like building blocks, they could be put together and make a really gorgeous quilt or quilted item. Because um, it just kind of makes a larger hexagon block. So I think that's what's fun about quilting too, is uh, that like once you learn just how all these geometric shapes uh, go together, then of course there's a huge art of storytelling and it's very culturally significant to a lot of uh, different groups. And they all tell um, stories and histories, and it's something that's endlessly fascinating and very, very important um, in uh, people's history, you know, especially here in America, um, you know, during just kind of the early years of American history, um, there were excuse me, lots of different ways to communicate, especially among black Americans, and uh, I, that's something that I would like to learn more about. I think I just owe it to myself as somebody in this medium to understand all the facets of the history. Um, and I would love to talk to some modern black quilters and see how that influence, um, you know, how they're keeping their history alive and, you know, everything there and really honor and venerate that. Because, you know, I have my own family ties, but it's, it's important to not just look at it from one perspective, um, especially when there is a history involved and, uh, you know, we definitely don't want to ever ignore one side of that or, you know, don't ever want to whitewash anything. And so it's important to listen to um, all, all groups that have, you know, kind of pioneered and kept their traditions um, through any given medium. So if you are unfamiliar, um, I would recommend doing what I am uh, recommending to myself, and that is uh, just making sure I know the history. So, oh, let's see, on that one, I pulled too tight, and what happened was it ripped right through. Uh, if you've been on the channel before, you know that I never use a uh, thread stronger than my fabric because it would have ripped the fabric instead of my thread ripping. However, it means that your thread can and will probably rip. So let me reset. I gotta figure out where everything was going and uh, check the chat. I hope you guys are also enjoying the Christmas music. This is something I am trying. Uh, it's not my normal style, but like I like Christmas music. I just I'm I'm old school. I like the uh, the ones in a slightly darker key. I like the ones with the moody voices. Uh, so kind of the uh, lo-fi beat is a little new to me, but I thought it would hopefully not be distracting over the uh, crafting today. All right, so we're gonna jump back in with our thread again. And like I said, this totally happens. Like uh, thread breaks, it, happens, it breaks on the machine, it breaks in your hand, it, it just breaks. But I'd rather it break now while I have the opportunity to uh, to fix it than later. I mean, then the good news is, is this will be a decorative item. So it's not something that like, I'm gonna be putting a ton of stress on. Um, but, you know, just one thing as you kind of learn to sew or craft in this type of medium is learning how strong um, each piece needs to be depending on kind of its uh, intended use. Now, I will be quilting this as well, and uh, if the definition of quilting is new to you, quilting, um, the act of quilting is what, when you have a quilt, for example, you have a backing inside which is called the batting and then you have your patchwork um, on top now there are always exceptions to the rules but it's normally those three layers and quilting is actually the act of uh, tying those all together be it by uh, sewing be it by buttons be it by uh, like tying knots um, and that is what makes a quilt a quilt versus like a blanket um, and so like when you have a quilted item like a quilt coat or a uh, quilted Christmas stocking in this instance, what I'll be doing is taking this patchwork layer um, and then s making a uh, little quilt sandwich with some batting and some backing and then sewing through all three of those layers uh, to not only give it strength but to give it that delightful quilted puffiness. Um, with a decorative item like this, quilting is not always necessary. Um, quilting is as much about the design as it is about the structure. Um, but it also definitely has an aesthetic, and um, I would like this to be quilted, so. I think, uh, for me, it makes it 
puffy, it makes it delightful. It kind of really adds even more like homemade charm uh, when something is quilted. If you guys were here for my stream when I quilted that baby quilt, um, just how like delightfully puffy it got was, it's, it's kind of hard to describe, but it's just very, very cozy. And uh, I think with Christmas, that's something like, that's kind of my main aesthetic. Uh, you know, if I had to pick one word, would be would be cozy. I like the um, the feelings of of Hugo. I like the just. It's winter. We slow down. We warm up. We gather. Um, you know, we light the fires and we keep ourselves warm. We bring back in the light. There's just something about the coziness of Christmas that is uh, very near and dear to my heart. So anytime I'm making something, and I can kind of imbue it with extra cozy. I'm, uh, I'm here for that. <laughs> All right, so just keeping on, keeping on. It's a project like this. It, uh, it said earlier that it reminds me of a puzzle, and that's partially because of the uh, geometric nature of this and kind of fitting them all together. Um, but it also has that same kind of zen meditative... Uh, feeling and I'm just it's like a puzzle with extra steps instead of just clicking them in together you gotta sew them together but it's just yeah, same feeling all right so again ladder stitch pull and adjust our tension and you can see our piece that we're making so I'm gonna knot that off right here for strength because like I said you've already seen the thread break a couple times it definitely is a thing that happens. So. Nice, tidy knots. Okay, and we'll put that back down. And this does go together fairly quickly, like all things considered. Um, I mean, it's, it's sometimes it's hard for my brain because I'm impatient, where I see it all laid out, and then it's like, and go. And I still have to sit here and join them all together. But I don't know. It's also like, hey, it's only been, you know, half an hour and it's laid out and now I'm putting it like actually physically together it's that's coming along pretty quick like here in a couple hours I'll have a Christmas stocking that we didn't have before like I don't know it's still neat it still kind of feels like a, a wizardry okay, so I'm coming back down um, to these this purple and pink one and I'm going to stitch up here and then we'll uh, add another hexi where we were missing one um, it is very common in the quilting world to abbreviate hexagons to hexes. So if you're wondering uh, what that was about, um, especially when you're, you know, saying it or typing it a lot, hexagon can get a little bit uh, chunky. So plus I think it's really cute. I, I like just, you know, uh, like very specific community uh, vernacular and little words that are you know, uh, obvious to the people that understand them, um, but can be t can be taught and passed. And I don't know, sl slang is absolutely fascinating um, to me. And uh, this one's cute. Like, yeah, they're little hexies. So if you see a quilter in your community talking about hexies, they are probably talking about English paper pieced hexagons or EPP. There's also something really satisfying about TLAs or three letter acronyms. So EPP instead of the English paper piece. English paper piecing. So, there we go. And I'll do this one up nice and close for you guys. And ta da! I don't know, it doesn't get old for me, so I hope it doesn't get old for you guys as well. But there's something kind of magic about sewing. So again, to lace it back down, pick up your next piece. That should be this one, this little one here. There we go. That's in it. Like I said, it really starts to come together quite quickly, um, which is fun and rewarding.
Do you guys do anything specific to get ready for the holidays? How, however you guys celebrate. I know there are, uh, you know, nearly 20 holidays that happen between November and January. So, yes, I will talk about Christmas, but please uh, jump in with any tradition that is important to you. Um, I'm not here to uh, make this anything but a friendly space. So, um, or I'm here to make it. All, all holidays are welcome and are uh, very much uh, respected here. And so I hope that however you are celebrating, that you have an awesome one. And uh, whatever tradition dictates that you are preparing, that it is filled with light and love and all things, uh, all things good this time of year. So if you are preparing anything for your holiday celebrations, let me know in chat. Um, I, we are just starting to uh, shift gears towards Christmas. We uh, had our Thanksgiving and it was absolutely lovely. Um, and now I'm starting to uh, jump into all things winter. One of the things I've been working on um, just for myself uh, is I picked up the, uh, the five string banjo a couple years back. And of course, uh, practice has been a little bit on the back burner just with all the craziness the last couple years have brought, but it was, um, it was my one thing that I, uh, do that's not for, like, a business or not for anybody but, you know, me and the, the people that I let in when we're practicing and jamming, and it's hard. I, I think that's something that you guys have all heard me talk about on the channel before is just that kind of urge, be it, um, situational or cultural, um, societal to just kind of monetize your hobbies um, and so to kind of fight back against that was a little bit of that like capitalist rebellion but it was also just something for my own mental health to just do something uh, that I could be unapologetically terrible at and not have any pressure to um, you know immediately try and turn it into a business and so that's what I use my banjo for um, and uh, one of the things I've been trying to do for a couple years is learn some holiday carols on said uh, banjo so that I can sing because that's one of the things my family we really like to do is we like to sing. Uh, come from a long line of, of scouts and carolers and choir people and so just uh, singing is something that we all do just just for the joy of it um, and so kind of being able to uh, play, the ba play the banjo as the background to that is something that I've actually, um, you know, thought about doing and have wanted to do for, you know, over a decade. I, uh, when I was a camp counselor, I originally wanted to, uh, learn the fiddle. I was, uh, camp counseling up at a beautiful, uh, campgrounds in, uh, Boone, North Carolina, and, uh, thought the fiddle would be perfect, but they were a tad bit out of my, uh, budget as a, uh, young camp counselor and so that just kind of got back burnered um until many 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 years later um i was fortunate to have the uh assistance and comfort in being able to live um just you know where we could try things and uh my best friend helped me get a banjo and um it's been it's been great it's like i said it's something that just brings me joy it's kind of like one of those bucket list things where like, I've just always wanted to have an instrument that I could take out camping, I could take out by the campfire, and uh, now to kind of be able to do it for Christmas as well is just kind of, eh, you know, frosting on the cake there. Um, but, you know, like, I'm very, very much a beginner. Um, I think <laughs> I've also talked about that kind of bell curve of uh, knowledge where when you're first starting something, um, you think that you're there's like a very quick uh like oh this is cool and I'm learning about this and I I know at least about this in theory and then you get to the top and you're like cool I think there's I think that's it I just have to put in the practice I think I know everything I need to know I just need to get better but then <laughs> you get over the top and realize that was just like the first part and then there's just a very steady valley of no there's now I know how little I know but then I'll get back up there and um I never want to quit just because of that kind of overwhelming like oh cool I know how much I don't know now um but it can be intimidating it's you know there's a lot of valleys in the creative process um and just kind of persisting through those uh despite how intimidating it might be uh, I think is what makes creative people just even more that even more 
just uh, formidable, but also just it's part of the creative process is pushing through when it seems kind of incredibly daunting or maybe even hopeless. Um, and so I'm in a similar place with my banjo playing where I had an amazing uh, teacher. I had a really, really good friend uh, teach me so much about music theory. Um, they had actually studied music theory and they played the bass and um, just really shared like almost an entire degree's worth of knowledge for, with me and I'm forever grateful. Um, but it did make me like realize how much I know and then, I, you know, I had played clarinet in, in middle school band and, you know, I always grew up with music, but, you know, I had a foundation and then forgot it. And then, you know, my friend came in and taught me all this. And then it was like, okay, big brain adult time. Like, oh, and that's how this works and that's how this is working. And then, you know, this was my first time with a stringed instrument. So that was so much different from playing woodwind. And, you know, it's like, whoa, I'm, I'm getting it. And then you start going into practice and you're like, okay, just because I understand the theory does not make me instantly a good player. <laughs> You know, and there's so much that has to just come from like, you know, uh, almost improv, um, which is something that I've always wanted to be better at, but you just have to, you just have to get out there. You know, it's not like you can study how to be better at improv, like beyond, you know, yes, and, 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 and studying what makes, you know, like kind of the human brain work, but like, it's just something you have to practice, you know? Um, and so that's the part where I, I am. And then of course, unfortunately with just 2020 and 2021 being so insane and then, uh, having to start, uh, homeschooling my daughter, which of course is amazing and I wouldn't give that up, but that took a lot of my time. Um, and then starting YouTube, starting Twitch, just really trying to find, um, you know, a balance between that whole work and life and, and, uh, teaching and creating and everything, you know, um, banjo sadly really got back Bernard um, for just anything you know not because I didn't love it but just because there's only so many hours in the day and I'm only one person and I'm already really terrible at self-care so it's like I didn't need to push myself um, but I've been able to uh, get my banjo back out again and really just even though now I I am frustrated with myself because I definitely could feel the drop-off in practice like like I know these but I'm just rusty um, and kind of having to fight the mental, just no, you know how to do this and not get frustrated with myself. But, um, now I'm getting back into it and warming the old fingers back up and it's, you know, I could get sad at myself for kind of letting the practice go, or I could just be okay with the fact that, Hey, at least I've picked it back up again. And so I had some very basic Christmas songs, very, very basic and, you know, not even any like, uh, n no roles, no like progressive chords, just, just you know, kind of finger picking just one note at a time kind of songs. And, you know, I laugh because it just reminds me of, you know, the like clarinet recitals in elementary middle school, uh, where you're just proud that you can, you know, kind of toot out jingle bells, but, uh, I can metaphorically toot out jingle bells on my banjo. <laughs> that makes me really happy. Uh, it really, really does. And, uh, Little Sprout, my daughter, she's get really finding her voice um, as far as like singing and, you know, just realizing that it can be fun. Like not everything has to be performative for the world or performative for anything other than just fun. Uh, but, you know, I think last year she wasn't quite ready for the whole like, you know, wassailing and caroling and all of that. But uh, this year she's got a memory for lyrics and uh, she's just five and a half. And, um, if she can learn one Christmas song as well as she could learn the entire Zombies 2 soundtrack, then uh, we're in a pretty good spot. So I think this year will be really fun and we can carol together, which I know will bring my parents great joy because, like I said, they, uh, they like to sing and always uh, encouraged us with the music because it, you know, builds the math side of the brain. And, it, you know, also it's just, I uh, think as a parent, there's something really cool about seeing your kid toot out jingle bells on their clarinet or their flute or whatever it is that they're playing, the recorder. I even know that uh, still gives me like <laughs> intense elementary school flashbacks. Um, you know, there's something good about music. Music is important to the brain and it's also just really fun to share that. So I think that's really been the uh, amazing thing about having a, having a kid is just uh, really rediscovering the things that like were formative and, uh, you know, seeing how her brain decides to do them, 
you know, what, what her brain picks up on and what it doesn't and what my brain, brain picks up on words and what hers, you know, and it's, I'm excited. So of course, sorry, I, I apologize for tripping over my words in my excitement. Um, but it is endlessly fascinating how human brains work and, uh, watching hers develop has been nothing short of fascinating. So that was my, uh, Christmas, Christmas prep story there. Um, just getting ready by uh, learning, learning jingle bells on the five string banjo. <laughs> so if you guys have any cool uh, holiday traditions, feel free to drop them in chat. I'd love to hear what other people do. Um, yeah. I think a lot of the ones that are you know, more mainstream, the cookie baking and the ornament making and the tree and the everything. I mean, they all have a wonderful time and a wonderful place. And, um, but yeah, if you do anything, even if it's one of the things I just mentioned or something I've never heard of, I'd, I'd love to hear it. I think the slowing down and reconnecting with family, you know, uh, my, my, uh, daughter's dad's side, we make tamales and, uh, you know, there's so many, so many different things that I've been very lucky to experience uh, throughout my life and now share through hers and, you know, I, I miss a lot of things just because of, you know, the separation while we're trying to keep everybody safe. But, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to getting back to some of them as we get, you know, get vaccinated and get healthy and can come back together. So I think this is kind of the year of of hope and, um, you know, not losing sight of what was important and really keeping the traditions alive, especially like my daughter, like I said, she's five and a half, um, really showing her now, like what's important to us and, you know, how we can not only honor our family and then, uh, you know, just give back to our community and really just how we do Christmas. So. And of course, uh, our Christmas is always, and uh, Christmas and Yule always involve a lot of crafts, uh, lots of handmade things around here. We like to make um, garlands for Yule out of the dried oranges and the cinnamon sticks and the star anise, uh, sometimes bay leaves, cranberries. Um, we do our frozen treasures where uh, we put out uh, frozen, uh, like, we'll fill like a, like a cake pan, like a little mini bundt pan um, with beautiful uh, things like just pine and cranberries and stuff and then we'll hang up kind of like ice sculptures uh, and then watch as the uh, cold winter sun melts them away and then of course everything is bird safe um, so that we can leave the treasures back where they fell. Um, I just I think again winter is really for me about slowing down appreciating what, what nature has for us in store, the beauty of winter. Um, I mean, yeah, it's a kind of a dangerous uh, beauty with the ice and the snow. And, you know, I think as a kid, you're just like, yeah, snow. And as an adult, you're like, oh no, it's cold. My garden's going to freeze and the ice is, the roads are going to ice over. Um, but it, it, again, it's just a annual reminder to slow down and be safe and gather close. Uh, yeah, I like to take the excuse to, to make things, you know. Like even winter says, take a break. I, my gardens are, I've got my fall garden. Where I live, it's still quite temperate. Uh, we reached 70 degrees Fahrenheit still today. Um, so I've still got things growing. Um, I've got some lovely carrots and artichokes and my pumpkins froze the other night. We did get a hard freeze, um, but we did get several off the vine. So the couple that were straggling, I, I lost, but uh, you know, you live and you learn and we had an un, uh, unpredicted frost, so. I, could, I couldn't have known to cover them. Um, it can be unpredictable out here in the desert. Uh, but, uh, you know, the carrots are still going really well, and that's been <laughs> fun to just watch Little Sprout kind of indulge straight from the garden on sweet purple carrots. Uh, but soon the gardens will sleep, and soon it'll get cold. And, you know, I, I've been kind of gearing up to make some very cozy cozy things um, while the while the winter rages uh, one of them being uh, little sprouts goose coat so I have quite the stubborn knot here so I'm trying to multitask and untie this knot um, but, 
Uh, if you joined me for the beginning part of that stream, we uh, made up the pattern, or we assembled the pattern um, and made a mock-up, but we'll be doing a patchwork coat for Little Sprout here very soon. Yeah, I'm going to have to have to cut this. That's okay. All right. Sometimes that happens. But yes, winter is reminding me to slow down and make things and get cozy um, and, and also just prior reprioritize. I mean, I think every season uh, does that. You know, you put the seasonal stuff first and it kind of just dictates where the priorities lay, you know. And winter is, for me, very, very much about um, pulling back in. I, I tend to overextend myself. Um, you know, I need to take stock and rest. And, you know, yes, rest <laughs> may mean working on different things uh, than I usually work on, but it's, it's different. It's, you know, especially for my brain being able to work on something else, um, something I've maybe been wanting to do but had to postpone. That is, that is a form of rest. It doesn't mean I have to be immobile. Um, it's just kind of honoring what my brain needs as far as stimuli and, you know, taking the self-care in, in doing that. And, and that's something I have been working on. Um, again, too, if you are new to the channel, um, I was diagnosed with ADHD as an adult, and um, it's been something that, while I've had my suspects, um, to have the... <sighs> To, to have the answers um, come to you later in life, um, like as you know, after you've kind of developed these crutches to get through everything, um, to get through school, to get through university, to get through everything, um, and then all of a sudden have <laughs> just this diagnosis where it's like, oh, well, that would have really informed a lot of my choices if I had known. Um, it's both, it's very bittersweet. Um, you know, and of course, I got my own diagnosis fighting for just getting proper like health care for my daughter and that happens to be how a lot especially in this generation of adults get diagnosed as they're advocating for a child in their life um but m more so uh, it's just you know there were things that I did that I just thought that was the only way I could do them and if it was uncomfortable to my brain too bad that's just how everyone else does it you know just just get on with it um and so to kind of have the strength in advocating um uh, for myself now has gone a long way um towards just, you know, self-care and self-respect. Um, and so I'm unlearning, you know, relearning and unlearning how to do a lot of things and to do them in a better way, in a healthier way. Um, and that's exhausting, but also probably one of the more freeing things I think that's ever happened in my life. And so, yeah, when I talk about, um, you know, resting, it might not always be just you know, complete stopping. It's just like giving my brain the, the proper stimuli and not stressing myself, um, in ways that aren't good for my brain anymore. And I, you know, it's, like I said, it's, it's led me down a healthier path, uh, kind of finally having that diagnosis. Um, definitely, definitely not limited by it. Um, in fact, I've actually never really felt more free, um, in that respect, um, because I finally, I, I do not think of it as a, oh, now I know what's wrong with me. I definitely think of it as a, all right, well, <laughs> this makes sense now. And, uh, okay, how would, what would, you know, somebody with this condition do? And uh, cool, let's do it that way. Let's, let's try versus just thinking, um, well, you're just the, too bad. Just do it this way. Everyone else can do it this way. What's wrong with you? Um, so it's just been freeing. So yeah, so I'm listening to my body, I'm listening to my, my brain, I'm listening to the seasons, and it's, you know, it's not like it just magically all clicked together um, once I got the diagnosis or anything. In fact, a lot of things fell apart. Um, like I said, I had made nearly 30 years of just trials and tem attempts and crutches and masks, and now it's like, no, okay, let's break those down and uh, let's build it up the better way. Um, but, you know... Talking about it definitely helps, and then looking at how it affects my creative practice helps. Um, I you like to watch a lot of other streamers um, that have ADHD, a lot of other YouTubers, because it does, you know, the, the brain works differently, and even their brains work differently than my brains and mine versus them. But it's more just seeing people uh, just be kind of un 
unabashedly excited and unapologetic about how their brain works and then celebrating all of that. Like, it's not always easy. It's not always magic. It's not always, you know, like we see on TV, but just not masking and not hiding anymore is a, it's a big deal. It's a really big deal. Um, so. All right. So I have most of the toe done. Um, this is exciting. You can see how it's really going to start to come together here. I'm still kind of playing around with pieces to, you know, I squint at it and then rearrange and go back and forth, um, but it's getting there. Now what's cool about like laying it out like this, um, if you've seen any other quilters work or um, if you've seen me working on a patchwork or anything, normally when you're working with a quilted project, uh, you'll be laying things out and there'll be seam allowance and so things will shrink and grow and change. Um, what's cool about like with EPP is that it already has the seam allowance like built into the card. So when I lay these things out, it is true to size um, and that's fun um, because I can know exactly how big it's going to be and I'm not fussing with okay, I need to leave a quarter inch here or a half inch there. Uh, it just, it just is. So. So I will need to go in and take like one of these guys and like cut that and put that there. Um, and just, I'll probably use some of these um, other ones that I have over here. They, the colors weren't doing it for me in the main part, but I can slide them in as like a half. Um, if you watched my mask, my EPP mask video, it's on YouTube, um, you can see how I was using half pieces to make uh, the borders right. Because right now it's very, very spiky. But you can take like a half one and uh, jam it in there. Like, I fold this one. And then get a straight edge uh, to sew along. So. Or speaking of so seam allowance, I could uh, just cut in on these and make it smaller or like this stocking I could bind the edge so there's a lot of ways I can finish this up which I'll get to when we're uh, ready for finishing details right now I gotta get it at least in one piece uh, before we figure out what we're doing with it so, <laughs> so I'm just gonna keep on uh, sewing little bits Now this thread is just gonna be uh, just gonna be like this, isn't it? It's really good to see so many familiar faces in chat. Thank you guys for uh, continuing to come back. I really appreciate it. Uh, I've been really finding the uh, really great community aspect here on Twitch and connecting with other streamers and audience members, and it's it's really cool. So thank you guys for being a part of it and uh, for letting me be a part of uh, your s s stream and Twitch experience. I really like the color of this one. It's kind of a nice jade color. So I can definitely like, you know, look around at these and decide which one I want where. Um, I'm gonna make a couple pairs. Um, 
and then I'll have a long line to sew because that can be really satisfying too. Uh, of course, the little pairs are fun because they're easy, <laughs> um, but sometimes just getting like a whole line uh, in one swoop is very nice to the, uh, the brain. Again, if you are just joining us, welcome, welcome, come on in. Uh, we are doing an English paper pieced hexagon rainbow Christmas stocking. And we are hand sewing that together with the ladder stitch. That's what I'm working on right now in my hands. Um, and just making some pretty rainbow ombre things today. And kind of talking about holiday traditions and then everything that just kind of <laughs> pops into uh, pops into chat and pops into my head, so uh, feel free to jump on chat anytime you'd like. And there we go, there's another little pair. I also think they look like little butterflies uh, when there's just the little pairs of them, um, which just, you know, is really sweet. Okay, so I'm going to tie off this pair here. Now, if I was to place those and I like it better like that. Now I can sew those together, and then when I have this whole row sewn open, then I can place it. And that's where the uh, when I when I first started this, I was talking about how it's kind of like a puzzle, um, and then you kind of have to plan out like your. Uh, your driving route or your plan of attack um, because it can you can sew this together incredibly inefficiently and that's fine sew it together one seam at a time that's it's getting done that's all that matters um, but you can also sometimes just really get these great like combo rows so like if I get these two sewn together then I can just be like and it just feels really satisfying <laughs> What I'm, what I'm looking at right here, um, in case you're wondering why I keep flipping this, um, there's this nice kind of jade, but I'm squinting at it and making sure it's not too bright compared to the other pieces. I kind of like it on the outside, but I might lose it when I chop this up, so I think I might put it in the middle. I just don't want anything to like stand out too weird in the final version, so this is the time to edit it. Yeah. Don't know. Or should I have switched this? No, that definitely needs to go like that. And yeah, we're gonna try it. The cool news is it's just thread. I can always uh can always cut it apart. Alright, so as always. Coming on in, tying myself a knot, and then ladder stitching. A project like this is definitely a really good uh, exercise in uh, trying out a new stitch, like the ladder stitch, because you, you can totally whip stitch these together. Um, some people are really, really quick at whip stitching and could probably have already had this finished. Uh, I like the ladder stitch because for me it's controllably neater. Um, I have less chance of my stitches, the like kind of errant stitches showing, um, and that way I don't feel bad about like using white thread on this whole thing because it's probably not going to show. Uh, if I was whip, whip stitching, I'd probably want to stick to the same color family, and I don't necessarily feel like changing thread colors that often. Um, again, comes down to expertise and preference. Um, I'm not claiming to have all the answers or have all the skill. It's more of a, this is the chaos that I have found to be uh, controllable. And that's what I am using. Um, so I like the ladder stitch because my stitches don't show as much and I can use one single thread color. Uh, but it is a little slower for me because I'm still learning the whip stitch. Oh. I mean, I, I understand it enough in theory, but everything takes a little bit more practice. So, you know, 
like I talked about that kind of uh, bell curve of expertise. I know enough to know how little I truly know. But of course, I've put in the work to get to that to that hill. So there's four of them together. We have two little two butterflies. Now it's a caterpillar. I guess we're devolving. Um, but now what I'm going to do is take that and place that on top here and get a whole other piece. Although I need to sew this one up before I do that. Uh, again, with having six-sided uh, patchwork pieces here, it means that there's up to six seams on each piece. Uh, reminds me of that uh, riddle about the cats. As I was going to St. Ives, I met a man with seven wives. Each wife had seven cats and all that. So there's six sides to each piece. Um, and all of them need to be accounted for. I guess it was seven in the riddle, but oh well. So ladder stitching. This piece. So I was able to obviously capture all the other scenes on this piece a little bit more efficiently and then had to go back in and get this one. But that's okay. You know, like I said, even if we sewed it one little edge at a time, one vertices at a time, we'd eventually get it done. So. Plus, no one's going to know when it's all finished, whether or not you are efficient or not. And if that's the odd question they ask first, well, bah. I'm hoping more people look and go, oh, cool, rainbows. Or, ah, oh, what a lovely stocking versus, was your flight path efficient? And if they answer that, I can give them a very, very confident, no, it was not. But, <laughs> you know. So, did that one, snip that off, lay it back in place, and go there. So this has been about three hexes wide, um, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three, and now we're getting up into the four range. Um, we're still kind of tipping it for maximum coverage and efficiency here, um, but we'll do two. So row of three, row of three, row of three, row of four, row of four, and then we get to the fives. Uh, where the heel is, and then we're back into the fours, and then we go back into the fives. Uh, and I may have to have um, either me or my mom make some more hexes um, just for side coverage, or we'll end up cutting into these to make the overall stocking smaller, because it's kind of like a puzzle. Except in this case, it's a puzzle where if you don't have enough pieces, you can just cut it smaller. Um, <laughs> Which is hilarious and freeing, and uh, really, I think that's one of the things where, uh, you know, from the outside, I don't think people realize how much uh, kind of hilariously creative freedom there is in some of these stuff, where, like, you look at a finished project and you have no idea how many times your creator went, yeah, I'm just gonna cut that off, or it doesn't need that, or, you know what? now it's four across instead of five across like forget it it's, it's, you know especially when you're making up your own pattern uh nobody has to, nobody has to know um and uh, i don't know i feel like it's simultaneously like this giant kept secret and also this big joke but also like you know once the item's finished it doesn't matter so i don't know it cracks me up um it's one of those weird things i find really funny um like ha nobody knows how mistake how many mistakes i made on this and they'll never know until I, you know, live broadcast them all. But now you guys are in on the secret. Now you can see the uh, kind of chaos that goes in behind the scenes. Or maybe you can uh, empathize if you are also a slightly chaotic crafter. Um, like, sure, I love to watch people who have their act together completely, and it, I marvel at them. Uh, I am not one of those. I, I know what I'm doing. I'm not a disaster. Uh, but, you know, there's definitely... There's definitely some chaos here, so... But, like, calm, cozy chaos with my crafting. So, if that, uh, <laughs> vibe resonates with y'all, please let me know. There we go. So, what I am doing, um, with these big floppy pieces is, of course, sewing that, uh, row of four to my toe clump, uh, that we had made, kind of piece by piece. And it wouldn't be EPP without 6,000 knots. I also uh, just re-got back into cross-stitching uh, for the first time in like 
25 years. Eh, a little less than that, but, um, which has been funny because my mom cross stitches and she always had cross stitch stuff out and it just never clicked in my brain. Um, but I think this time around, I'm like, it's just pixel art. Like it's just pixel art. It's pixel art. I can do pixel art. And it's been kind of, uh, really re-fascinating again. Um, the reason I thought of it is just if my thread tangled half as much of it as it's doing now, I would not be able to cross stitch just for fear of insanity. I don't know what is going on today. Um, but I feel like I finally matured enough to do cross stitch and my stitching actually looks pretty dang good. And that made me really proud. Um, so of course, naturally, because I had something good going for me and bragged about it. Uh, my stitching today is on the um, more chaotic side. <laughs> nah, that's not how it goes, but sometimes it feels like that. The good news about this is there's seam allowance and you can't see my stitches, so... Ow. Yeah, I've been doing a cross stitch of a little little farmhouse and a little fox among the grapes and it's you know just country and idyllic and I don't know makes me happy guess what I got another knot in my thread that's just how how it's gonna be huh some days it just do be like that don't it goodness gracious all right well with the fact that it's just gonna be knotted we're gonna carry on. So I am <laughs> sewing this this way. Um, trying to keep my tension nice, trying to get those ladder stitches to actually do what they are supposed to, and uh, trying to make sure I'm only having my basting stitches show. So. Also let me know your guys' favorite uh, like holiday song and chat. I, I was talking earlier about uh, playing holiday carols on the instruments that I have learned throughout my life. Uh, I always like the ones that are in like a spooky minor key. Um, <laughs> even though like my favorite thing about the holidays is they're cozy, I'm like bring on, bring on the spooky minor key. Give me like, you know, uh, Oh Come All Ye Faithful or something where it's just in a, in a darker, like I don't know, dark Christmas songs. Just, they amuse me. Um, So the piece is now getting big enough that it will get caught in my thread, which is, <laughs> while it's annoying, it's also one of those where it's like, ah, sweet, it's gotten big enough to be caught in my thread. So we're making progress. It's kind of like, you leveled up, here's this level of difficulty. Now your piece is unwieldy and will get caught in your thread. But it's getting there. It's definitely a something. I think without context, it'd be hard to tell what it was. So I am still doing the ladder stitch, even though I'm not folding my pieces over right now. Uh, sometimes when it gets big enough to kind of be self-supporting, um, I can get in there without uh, needing to pinch the two together, but still, still gathering it up in there. So not attached, yes attached. EPP is something that's uh, new to me in the last uh, like year and a half. Um, I had tried foundation paper piecing or FPP, um, which my mom loves and she's crazy good at it. Uh, it was one of those things that did not click in my brain and I struggled with FPP. Um, 
FEP is how you can get really cool, crisp, geometric shapes. Um, if you ever see a quilt that has, like, I don't know, really cool geometric dragon or something on it, it's probably done in FPP. It's any paper piecing is there to aid the uh, sewist in just maintaining crisp angles. Like, obviously, this, uh, like, without the paper would be very hard to get these little uh, geometric shapes. Um, but foundation paper piecing, you actually sew through the paper. Um, you, like, you have a paper, you have pieces of fabric, you, like, put them down, you sew it, and then you fold it, and then you add other pieces, and you fold it, and then ultimately the paper comes off the back. And it's, it's cool. My brain does not like the multi-step process of it one bit. I, I can understand it. I could probably look at a pattern and tell you how to do it doesn't mean I'm good at it in practice. Um, and so I, you know, with that kind of experience, I looked at EP, when I found out about EPP, I'm like, nah, I'm good, I'm good. I don't care that it's English, it's still paper piecing. Um, but this <laughs> sits with my brain better um, because I can join them at the sides, which of course, when I first learned, I was like, wait, you're sewing it together, not flat, not under the machine, but at the sides. And that was a, a kind of a mind whirl there. Uh, but now I am absolutely fascinated by it and uh, got to learn the ladder stitch and got to uh, do all sorts of stuff. And I, I really enjoy it. I don't do it all the time because it's a lot of work. Um, but I've made a quilt. It was actually my, my very, very first 100% hand uh, pieced and hand quilted quilt was English paper pieced. And uh, it's around here somewhere. I think the cat is sleeping on here. Um, but if you've seen the blue and cream quilt, uh, either on my Instagram or, uh, when I was quilting the other, the baby quilt on my stream just a couple days ago, uh, I brought that one out for show and share. Uh, but my first ever, uh, hand quilted one was all EPP. And so obviously I had to like it enough to bother making a whole quilt because um, if I didn't like it, I probably wouldn't have finished it. So just based on threads. So when you're making EPP, um, there's a couple different ways you can attach the little uh, paper thingies to your fabric. Um, one of them is by uh, thread basting, which is what these are. Like if I hold them up, you can see that there's little threads running through them. And uh, I, as I mentioned in the beginning of the stream, this is a collaboration uh, between my mom and I. She made all the hexes and I am sewing them together. Um, and so she thread braid thread based with all of these. Um, I am team glue based, uh, in which you fold your fabric over the little uh, pieces of paper and glue them like with a glue stick. Uh, you know, you can be more responsible and use a special fabric glue, uh, but it feels delightfully arts and craftsy to my brain. I don't know, like just big macaronis art glitter arts and crafts feelings from kind of getting to glue the fabric to the uh, to the paper and I find it delightful. Um, and so because of that I am I keep getting distracted by these threads because I'm not a thread baster and I keep thinking my threads are showing and they're not it's just the basting uh, because normally there wouldn't be threads because I would have glued them. Um, but there's different ways to do it and it no no right or wrong um, actually the only consideration you should take into is your your comfort level and what you like to make and then also just your fabric um sometimes the glue can stain uh if you're working with like something crazy delicate but then also if you're working with something hyper delicate you might not actually want all the extra thread holes in it like if you were going to do epp with like vintage linen or something so in that case the uh, washable glue might be better because it wouldn't put extra thread holes in so you know uh, it's really a situational thing there and you just kind of got to feel it but I like the glue. It's quicker for me. Um, and then I get to, I get to glue things. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think that's, it's just a big brain feel in there. Just yay glue stick. So, uh, sorry if you keep seeing me check the threads. It's just because I am not used to having thread based at hexies. Um, so it's different. Not bad. Just, just different. But with the thread-based did hexes, it is easier to reuse uh, the papers just because they're not getting all sloopy from the glue. Um, yeah, there's 
and then actually if you um, really know what you're doing you don't even actually like sew through the paper or anything so there's like no holes uh, when I thread base I just stab threads through the paper too because they're my papers and uh, you know if they're part of this they they're used to chaos that's just how we roll here um, plus what's cool is a lot of people are like making their own hexes out of recycled paper uh, you can get like a punch like from the scrapbooking uh, section and just get hexes and there we go look at that look at that uh, and make your own out of like cardstock or mailers or whatever especially like I don't know about you guys but I get some like really nice junk mail like really nice cardstock and I know that's like the graphic designer and the marketer in me that's like ooh pretty paper ooh letterpress um, but yeah if you know waste not want not uh, you can definitely use those to make some uh, hexi bases okay So, I'm going to make another row of four, methinks, because that was kind of fun doing it that way. And then what's cool is we're going to get to the point where we can start taking the paper out of these, which uh, is another really satisfying thing about EPP, uh, is taking out the paper. I think it's uh, another reason why my brain likes this is um, there is this big middle section here that's nice and repetitive, so you can kind of get into it, but then um, I talked about just different, like different stages like gluing the hexes or prepping the hexes uh, pulling the hexy papers out is so satisfying um, not only does it like just change the way this whole project feels so it's a very uh, like tactile thing but it also just mm, it's a big old like I've made enough progress to be able to take my forms out and you get to see the thing like behave as fabric for the first time um, it, you know, like right now it's very stiff, obviously it's half paper, uh, but when you take this out and it just turns into soft fabric again and it's beautiful patchwork with crisp corners, yet it moves like just fabric again, it's, it's, it's really good. It's really good. So it's very tactile, uh, ASMR type good feels. And I, you know, I don't know about you, but I also just really love big big tangible feelings of progress um, so it's like yes we are taking the paper out for at that stage you know check we're there um, it feels good you know just like making a to-do list and checking off something off it's it's nice it's like I'm making progress okay so yeah I'm just really quickly uh, kind of whipping these guys together Again, there are six sides to each of these, and so there will be up to six, up to six seams on each piece. Um, so they all need to be joined, and sometimes you just have to go a little, a little bit out of order to make sure that they all are uh, present and accounted for. is our little dough. Gonna take a second here to kind of untangle the old threads. And I've got a couple knots in this, so I'm actually gonna ditch this thread. Sorry thread. And get myself a fresh one. double thread and then tie my knot. Uh, I like to double thread um, even though it tends to bite me in the butt 
because it's stronger. I'm getting two threads in there. Uh, it does get tangled more often, so like most things, there is a trade-off. Um, but I like to just know that there's two threads in there uh, so that I can be a little bit rougher with it and knots happen <laughs> even if I've got one thread. So there's not any way to prevent me from getting tangled, so I might as well up my structural integrity uh, if it's unavoidable for tangles. So. So again, I'm going to make a couple little pairs, a couple little butterflies, and then make a snake, and then sew the snake to uh, what we're working with. And those are not official quilting terms. We are just, you're rolling with an artist here, and it looks like a snake, so it's a snake. Plus, I don't know, snakes are cool. Do you guys have favorite animals? I feel like as an adult, as adults, we don't ask each other these questions anymore. Yeah, that's what's fun about hanging around kids is like, as an adult, nobody just comes over and says, hey, what's your third favorite dinosaur? But like, as adults, I don't know. I, I don't like just small talk, like ask me weird questions. You know, ask me to name parts of an iguana. Uh, you know, ask me to talk about my favorite time travel theory. You know, I like weird small talk. I like weird, um, in case you guys haven't noticed. I like cozy chaos, dungeons and dragons, things joined together with an ampersand. There we go. So, so here we make butterflies, butterflies and snakes. Oops, butterflies don't fly. There's a butterfly. <laughs> and again, I'm not knotting each one of these just so that one I know that they are secure and my tension doesn't pull out and two that way I can cut my thread in between um, before I make them into snakes. I started my stream a little later this week uh, just to try some uh, different times out, times out and it's actually getting dark where I am. So I hope that, and I'm on the uh, west coast, so that means wherever you guys are, it is much later or approaching much earlier <laughs> than where I am. So I hope you, are guys, you guys are having a lovely evening, uh, no matter where you are or what you're doing. Thanks for coming out and spending some of it with me. I always like to say whether you're here for cozy vibes or here for artistic inspiration or here for the community i hope whatever it was you're here for that you found it um, there's a lot of craziness going on and so i hope for uh, just a little bit in this corner of the internet you were able to just chillax and uh, seek what you found i found what you were seeking there we go words are hard but nonetheless genuine So for the, you know, 50th time here, we're just going to do a, a little ladder stitch. I also think that one of the fun things about watching people live on Twitch is I also I also make YouTube videos um, and those you know will take 15 hours of work and edit it down to about 15 minutes um, I think there's something about seeing the process that you know it's not like it's not the vibe I like all the time sometimes I love I love me a good TikTok uh, give me 15 seconds um, but also just being able to be uh, there for every step of something like this is it's kind of neat I, it's you know it's a peek behind the uh the curtain a little bit so thanks for uh being with me i don't feel the pressure to rush i'm just in my studio in my zone doing things in real time um, and now you know if you are a uh, sewist yourself you can empathize uh at the time it took and if you're not then maybe you'll uh 
I don't know, kind of gain a new perspective, a new uh, appreciation. I was watching a woodworker, and I've, I've done a little bit of woodworking, uh, not as much as I'd like to. Um, but yeah, just seeing somebody just put in the hours, it's like, ah, yeah, I've, you know, maybe put in a fraction of that ever on one project, and I'd love to do more, but, you know, just, it's like, wow, watch them, just, there they go, watch them keep going, you know, and come back days later and keep working on it. It's, it's, it's endlessly fascinating, actually, and stained glass art is something I love watching people do. I just, I love watching other people, uh, other people do. I was watching, uh, Looney Loom Works work their loom today and uh, you know it's it's all fiber it's it's just all different types of different types of things so you know, even in a small uh, niche community like fiber art uh, there's still so many people doing so many different things with their craft it's cool it's cool to see so if you do any crafting uh, let me know in the, in the chat I'd love to know what you guys are working on, what you do, or even what you aspire to do. Um, I think sometimes just getting it out there and saying, hey, I want to try this, you know, maybe it puts it along your path or puts it out to the universe, you know? You never know. If you keep it, keep it a secret, then it may never happen. Got another big knot here. Big surprise. Sometimes I can get them out. Sometimes they're... Uh, here to stay. Well, that one's pretty, pretty on there. If I could secure my work half as well as these like weird errant knots just decide to, then I'd be okay. Right. Well, anyway, there's my snake, and this one's green, so it's kind of perfect. There we go. All right, time to get a new thread, or we'll just use that knot as a knot. That'll do a little bit of it. So we're gonna take our next row of four. Drop it a couple times for good luck. Forget exactly which corner we were lining it to. There we go. And pick it up and start sewing. In a lot of ways, this is kind of similar to like a pixel art where you definitely need to work cross stitch. You definitely don't wanna be one position off, so. Making sure you know exactly what corner, because they all start to just, so yeah, yeah, this is, I'm aligning it to a vertice, it should be fine. Check, check your vertices and points before you get too far, especially if you're making a pattern. Um, what's nice about this kind of random ombre is if I was one off, um, I probably could just stick another one in there, but you know, if you're making like a very specific pattern, you don't want to be off. Again, ladder stitching to join the row. So that really nice kind of pull as it comes together. And it really is fun to, you know, like with quilting and sewing, you're kind of ironically taking pieces of cloth and cutting them up and then making them back into a piece of cloth. Um, but especially like when you're working with like uh, like a scrap quilt or EPP, like the pieces start small, um, and so to kind of join them and to make a a whole cloth again is like, look, I'm I'm making something. It feels definitely like there's progress, you know. Like when you're knitting and you're like, this is literally one piece of spaghetti, and now I have made a scarf. Like it's it's hard not to feel kind of like a a wizard. I will probably go till my eyes get tired. Um, I should be wearing glasses. I am healing still from a facial injury um, and had surgery earlier this year. And so I 
haven't gotten glasses that fit my face uh, post-surgery yet, so, you know, we do what we can, um, but I am quite farsighted, so after a little bit of near work like this, my eyes will get tired, so I am learning not to push myself beyond healthy boundaries, um, so I will go till my eyes hurt, well, not hurt, but I will go till my eyes start getting tired, and then I will stop. The good news is I can stream tomorrow and we can carry on right where we left off. And even though I tend to be on the more, but I want to see it all finished. There is something about coming back to a project or a book um, for multiple sessions. Just being like, ah, oh, yes, there's no rush. We're just here to enjoy each other's company. I think that's why I love reading really long, like, you know, two, three hundred thousand sto word stories is because, yes, if the conditions are right, I can uh, binge it all. But sometimes you just have to come back. Um, and then it's the anticipation. Like, ah, yes, I've got a good story waiting for me. Um, so, I hope you guys get a similar feeling when you are watching live streamers. I know I do, so. It's fun to feel like you're part of it as well. I like watching, you know, coming back and being like, ah, oh, yes, I remember when we started this, and look how far they are. You know, it's... It's fun to root for other creators too, and just, I don't know, we're all just out here to try and make, try to make good things. Tell our stories. Tell good stories. Make stuff with stories. You know. Alright, so there's another satisfying thread pull. Kind of looks like grapes. Oftentimes these uh, start to take on funny shapes, uh, and I definitely try to make, keep my shapes uh, G-rated here. Uh, right now this one looks like grapes, and it's amusing. Um, but it's just making me think that it might be kind of fun to do almost a hexagon pixelated like world map. Like these would, this uh, would lend itself kind of like, you know, uh, like, I don't know if you guys saw Lego's um, cool map that they just came out with, their wall map, but similar vibe. But, you know, geometric, but not necessarily, like, on the grid. Um, but hexi, hexi geometry would make a cool world map. And I do like cartography. That'd be neat, because this, you know, obviously has a shape reminiscent of, you know, several continents and stuff. But just an idea. Good old brain always kind of thinking about what could be next. That might be really fun, actually. That'd be also really fun in Rainbow as well. Alright, so there we go. Now we have our 3, 3, 3, 4, and 4. And again, this is just kind of how it happens to be. Um, I'm not using a pattern. I'm just using this cute needlepoint stocking uh, that's here on the table with the little bear. It's cute. As, uh, as my pattern. Um, what I did was I just raided my mom's stocking stash 
uh, which, yes, my, my parents' last name uh, is Stocking, and uh, we do a lot of stockings um, as decor. And my mom makes a ton of stockings, uh, mostly quilted, a couple cross-stitch. Um, they're very pretty. So now we're going to do a row of five. So we've been taking two, two butterflies and then making a snake and making a row of four. Um, now I'm going to have to do um, a group of three and a group of two and make a longer snake. Yeah, I still like that. And occasionally I'll still like pick them up, put them back down, make sure I still like the colors next to each other. because. Yeah, this isn't set in stone, um, and this one hasn't moved around as much as some of my other Hexi projects, because, uh, you know, I like to lay it out and then take a picture because inevitably I'm going to pick it up. Luckily, this one has stayed fairly flat. I'm actually <laughs> surprised, um, come to think of it. Uh, like, when I'm making EPP masks or when I was working on that quilt, it ended up everywhere. Um, so I was glad I had pictures. So this one's actually behaving, so go figure. I could pretend that's because I know what I'm doing, or I could just enjoy the uh, enjoy that it's working out. So, I'll probably get up into the yellow uh, for today. What I've still got to figure out, and I'll uh, need to give my brain some residency time, is if I want to quilt and then bind this off like it was a um, quilt or if I want to uh, what's called pillow casing which is where you like sew a fr let's pretend the inside of my palms are the uh, inside and then this is the outside of the pretty side uh, if you want to put them like right sides together and then flip it so that it's like pillow cased and all the seams around the inside or if you want to sandwich them and then put binding, um, like that kind of blanket edging that's on quilts, uh, that's called binding. Uh, you can do either way on this. Um, binding requires a lot more handwork, uh, but does lend itself uh, not only just like a certain like kind of aesthetic, but um, you get an opportunity for another uh, color because the binding will have to be something. So it can definitely feel like a frame. It's kind of like getting your uh, work nice and matted and framed um, in that regard and so sometimes it's just the perfect kind of uh, final addition to something. Other times it might be too much or too busy in which case uh, pillowcasing um, would be the better option. Pillowcasing is also simpler um, so if you don't want to do you know 10 more hours of handwork, <laughs> yeah it's not going to be 10 hours, it's going to be an hour, uh, another hour of handwork then you know you have to do another hour of handwork. So no wrong answers here. Um, what I will be doing um, for this, in addition to it being um, all patchwork uh, like this, I want to see, and this will also just, if it ends up working out, my plan was to, right here in this kind of middle zone where all these yellows and greens are, was to put a little pocket on the outside of the stocking and then make a little plush buddy. Um, I don't know if you guys caught my stream or my YouTube where I made the little tiny kitten plushes, but I love to make a uh, little, like, tiny miniature, well, they're not super tiny, like, medium miniature uh, plush, just because, I don't know, everything's cute or when it's small. Like, like oversized things or small things are just fun things. It's like, your brain's like, ah, it's not the size it's supposed to be, in which case I love it. Um, but I like to make little plush, and I thought it'd be really cute to, uh, have a little pocket on this stocking with a little plush. I'm thinking a little cat. Um, so if I do the pocket, then I will probably bind the stocking off on the edge, uh, in whatever color I do the pocket in. And that way I can also do the cuff in that color, and then it looks like I planned it. Uh, as far as the color scheme goes. Um, if I decide to not do the pocket because this is already wonderfully busy enough, then I will probably pillowcase it because then I'm not introducing another color. So that's just kind of how the design evolves. Um, 
I could have planned it out, but really I was given a pile of hexes and the freedom to do with them what I wished, as long as it became a stocking. So <laughs> I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna take it and run with it. Goodness. Excuse you, scissors. Do we not want to work? Wow. I don't think I've ever gotten my thread wrapped around the central screw in a scissor before. I dare say those need to be sharpened. Which <laughs> I uh, shouldn't be allowed to take on any more hobbies because goodness knows uh, the excuse of wanting to be a polymath only goes so far until you're like, no, you need to settle down and pick a couple things. Uh, but scissor sharpening and blade sharpening is something that at least my argument is that it can be practical because I use a lot of sharp things in my line of work and if I could learn how to sharpen them, then I would not only be getting to satisfy the old uh, brain in wanting to learn something new, but then it would be practical, so it's totally reasonable. <laughs> and then I don't have to wait for like the opportune scissor sharpening person to wander through, because that doesn't happen, happen as often as one would like it to. I can be my own. And then in that like kind of ongoing quest to romanticize my life, I can feel like an old blacksmith, sharpening, forging my blades for the upcoming trials and attacks. And then you just get to... <laughs> it's like uh, wearing a cloak and then doing something just feels uh, a gajillion times more magical than doing whatever it is. I'm sure you've all seen those like Tumblr or Twitter posts that are like, you know, don't say you're running errands, say you're running a quest. Or, you know, if you're like just kind of like re-romanticizing or even mm, like fantasizing on your life can really take those mundane tasks. Cool, my thread just broke. Uh, and really just, you know, help help the brain want to do them if you kind of give it a fun flavor. Um, I really like adding that kind of geeky flavor to it, so it's like, yes, I'm running quests, I'm on an adventure, but uh, for my last video, I made cloaks for myself and my daughter, and uh, now if we're going out on a walk, we're going out on a cloaked walk, and if one or more of us doesn't end up twirling or casting off our cloaks dramatically, then it just, you know, this just makes it more fun, doesn't it? My uh, kiddo is also, you know, into into Frozen and musical numbers and is just as dramatic as her dear mother and uh, <laughs> so I had to make sure that Little Sprout's cloak could handle being like thrown off her shoulders as she does the whole like cold never bothered me anyway thing so I uh, had to make sure hers was machine washable because she keeps insisting on like yeeting it backwards and it's it's windy here and dusty so <laughs> Uh, the things I, like, never thought I'd, like, have to think about as, like, a mom, but as, like, as a nerdy mom, it's like, oh, I'll have to make sure her cloaks are machine washable because <laughs> we're gonna be dramatic. <laughs> but also, that's the kind of stuff that's like, yes, I'm doing it right. Uh, you know, so that's, uh, that's just fun. But speaking of that video, uh, my cloak and cowl video, that will be going up. Uh, tomorrow actually Sunday is my upload day and uh, so if you guys do not already follow my YouTube channel uh, my links are on my profile I'll have my mod dump them in chat or if they're taking their break I will dump them in chat um, but I will be uploading aforementioned video tomorrow I am thinking about changing my upload day uh, just because it's hard to stream and upload a video on Sunday and I do like streaming on Sundays. Uh, so I may go back to my original Thursday as my upload day. So uh, let me know if that works for you guys or not. Um, but I'm just kind of shifting around the schedule a little bit. I think kind of as the uh, channel continues to grow and the stream continues to grow, we'll just uh, figure it out, right? All right, now we have a snake. So that's our first row of five. So we've gone from three to four and now two, five. And out of context, it doesn't resemble a stalking, but it'll get back there. It will. Um, but I don't know, it's looking really cool. Um, I think before I go today, got threads 
all over me. I'm going to take out some of the paper because um, it's fun. I'm going to leave enough in to keep it nice and rigid, uh, but I think I'm going to take out, let's see, these middle ones. So it really is just a matter of popping them out because like I said, the way that uh, my mom does them because she knows what she's she's doing, the, the thread... The thread from the thread basting doesn't actually go into the into the paper piecing, so I can pop these right out um, and save them and reuse them, which, hooray, eco-friendly. Um, it also just makes it really easy to pop, pop them out, and it's super satisfying. So I'm going to try not to bend them, um, and obviously try not to hurt my patchwork or make horrendous noises, um, but I'm just going to pull out a couple just because then you guys can really see uh, the difference here. It doesn't seem like a huge difference, um, but really by feel, it, it's night and day. Um, this is just back to soft fabric. And you can see now the papers are missing and it's gonna behave just like a quilt top. Um, and as a quilter, that's, that's very satisfying. Um, I can also kind of snip away some of these basting threads that have pulled through, because I no longer need them. I mean, you can see if you can get light behind it. I'm not quite sure if you guys can pick up on that because the way I have my lighting. Um, but it's now there's no paper and it's soft fabric again. So that, I don't know, it's cool. And then you end up with this uh, really satisfying kind of pile of epexies and know that you're ready to start the project again. So. I'm gonna look really quickly uh, for somebody to raid because it looks like all of my friends are offline, um, which is fine. Uh, just interesting. All right, cool. What we are going to do. So we're not going to raid quite yet. Um, I'm just going to look at my pattern just for a little, just a few more minutes. Um, so if you guys have any questions, now's the time. If not, I'm going to be jumping off my stream here uh, in a few minutes. I really appreciate you guys coming out. I really, really am thrilled to see some uh, familiar names popping up week after week. Um, it really means the world to me, guys. And... Uh, I hope you guys had fun and learned something. Like I said, if you're here for the, uh, here just to hang out, absolutely great. It's been a pleasure to have you. If you're here looking for inspiration for your next project or your current project or anything, I hope you found it. And uh, as always, the bus's doors are always open and you are always welcome on board the bus. Uh, my name is Catherine. We're here aboard Art Schooly. Art Schooly is my, um, he is my reclaimed and refurbished school bus. And this is where I do my studio practice. And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here, and thank you for joining me. So, actually, as I pause to evaluate my project, I realize I am going to instate my healthy boundaries, keep my eyes from getting tired, and we are going to spread the joy and raid another channel. So if you are new here, raiding means that we are going to keep the party going and join another channel as they do their creative thing. But it just means that I will be signing off, and I'll see you guys somewhere else in my little corner of the internet. So we are going to be raiding King's Creation. They are making a resin tumbler cup. And that is another thing that is endlessly fascinating in its creative process. And so I hope you guys have just as much fun with them as you did here with me. And that I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the evening. So please enjoy the raid. And uh, we will be uh, back on tomorrow. I'll see you guys later. Bye. Let's do it.